platform to over 195 countries, and I am your host, Dr. Ariel Ortiz Lagardere. Today's topic of global concern is the clash of two pandemics, COVID-19 and implications for obesity, diabetes, metabolic, and cancer surgery. And introducing today's distinguished panel of experts from the United States, Professor David Cummings. From India, and surgeon to His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, Professor Pradeep Chaubi. Dr. Ken Loy from Australia. Professor Charles Peng Zhang from China. Professor Aurora Pryor from the USA. And now our president and founder from IBC Oxford University Global Organization, Professor Tomas Rogula. Tomas, welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, this is great privilege to uh, provide a second webinar on uh, such an important topic uh, as we all experiencing now every day. Uh, I'm really grateful for such a such a great experts that are uh, coming tonight to share uh, life uh, and authentic experience how they deal with, with this uh, dramatic situation which we have to deal on every day. So again, thank you so much for joining us and please enjoy our second program. We will uh, gather all questions and comments at the end of the program and we will uh, discuss them at the end. Ariel, back to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rogula. Well, let's start off with a program and uh, let's start off by saying uh, that the first topic is basically on metabolic disease and it is COVID-19 and on obesity, diabetes and metabolic surgery with Professor Cummings. Dr. Cummings, welcome to this live cast. I'm going to share my screen now. Hopefully yes, please. Work. Ariel, am I shared? Yes, you are now. And I still see the um, thumbnail images of all the faculty blocking the slide. Can those be taken away? They, they, they are already. Just not on my screen? Exactly. OK. So uh, everyone, welcome. And I hope you're all doing reasonably well out there in these strange times. I'm going to talk to the, today about an entirely new topic bariatric metabolic surgery in the COVID-19 era. First, I disclose that I'm a principal investigator on the COSMA trial funded by Johnson & Johnson and the ARMS trial previously funded by J&J &J and Covidian, although now entirely by NIH. Apart from that, all the funding I've had continuously for the last 30 years has been NIH. I will discuss with you today some work that's been done by faculty from the Diabetes Surgery Summit series of consensus development conferences. Over the past 13 years, I've had the privilege to be one of the main directors and organizers of the DSS series. We've, con we've convened six total large international consensus development conferences, if you include our world congresses. And among the many things we've done is to come up with new guidelines for the use of metabolic bariatric surgery to treat type 2 diabetes. And with high consensus, have advocated that this should be considered as a treatment option for poorly controlled type 2 diabetes in patients with a BMI as low as 30 or down to 27.5 for Asians, instead of the higher, very BMI-centric NIH 1991 standards, which have governed the field globally for almost three decades now. We estimate that about 300 million people with diabetes would be uh, amenable to thinking about a possible metabolic surgery to treat their, their disease who would not, if by the DSS-2 standards, who would not be uh, able to think about this by the old NIH 1991 standards. That is, if our DSS-2 standards are widely accepted. Here's where we stand right now. The colors in red are the ones I'm aware of that have adopted as national policy, the DSS-2 standards for criteria for metabolic surgery instead of the old 1991 NIH ones or something similar to DSS-2. So when a time came to consider how we're gonna think about bariatric metabolic surgery in the COVID era, it made sense to turn faculty from these DSS conference series. And so what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is a new manuscript that some of us have put together. It's currently under expedited review at one of the Lancet journals, and it's got a really long title, DSS Diabetes Surgery Summit, Recommendations on the Management of Candidates for Bariatric Metabolic Surgery and Prioritization of Access to Surgery During and After the COVID-19 Pandemic. 
it's an interesting fact that the presence of either obesity and or diabetes greatly increases both the risk of contracting the SARS-CoV-2 virus and from suffering worse outcomes if you get the COVID-19 disease. This has been well shown now in three studies published, one from France, one from uh, Italy, and another from China, as well as there are five manuscripts under review on the same topic at Diabetes Care that I'm aware of, all of which make it very clear that obesity and diabetes increase the risk of getting and suffering badly from COVID-19. The various mechanisms are being established now. It's also very well established that bariatric metabolic surgery is the most effective treatment option for both obesity and diabetes. So if you just take those first two points together, logically you might argue, well, we should be pushing for more bariatric metabolic surgery right now in the midst of the pandemic to try to help it out. The problem is that, uh, that surgery itself increases contagion from both to both patients and staff, especially this kind of operation, which involves a bunch of procedures that aerosolize under pressure droplets. So those would be things like pneumoperitoneum, electrocautery, ultrasonic shearing, upper GI endoscopy, and other things. So on balance, our group felt that the immediate risks of contagion outweighed the theoretical benefits of surgery to reduce diabetes and obesity, and therefore problems with COVID. Ultimately, however, the COVID-19 pandemic will abate and elective surgeries will be resumed. So we, we basically think that all elective surgery should be held for the moment and bariatric metabolic surgery is in that category. But eventually, electric surgery is going, elective surgery is going to resume. And then there's going to be a really large backlog of patients who've been waiting for some number of months for this operation. And there'll be long delays in getting through that backlog, delays which will progress both people to move forward in their disease and will cause some degree of harm. How much harm for a given individual depends on his or her burden of obesity-associated diseases that cause things like cardiovascular disease. The old-fashioned, very heavily BMI-based criteria for determining surgical candidacy really don't deal with this issue at all. So our group is offering a new strategy to prioritize surgery based heavily on the burden of metabolic diseases most likely to hurt people and most likely to be ameliorated post-op. So we started by just identifying different categories of surgical prioritization. The first one called urgent access would be for somebody who's got a problem that's deteriorating quickly or an immediate complication of a surgery. This one's kind of common sense, general surgical knowledge. I'm not gonna go into detail about it. The other two categories are the ones I'm gonna discuss. First would be what we call expedited access, should be try to get surgery done in three months or standard access. And in the context of the COVID backlog, this would be surgery within a year. I know that's a long time to wait, but we're gonna be in backlog. I will go into the details of what, about what constitutes expedited versus standard in the next slide. So here's our algorithm prior, for prioritizing bariatric metabolic surgery shortly after COVID-19 is over. First, we divided bariatric metabolic surgery into three categories based on the primary indications for the operation. First, you've got diabetes surgery done primarily to treat that or obesity surgery done primarily to treat that. And I'll explain in a moment what adjuvant bariatric metabolic surgery means. So if within each of those categories, we're gonna define a priority of access as either being expedited or standard based on patient conditions. So let's go through the first one as an example. If you're primarily operating for diabetes, we suggest that expedited access should be afforded to patients who have one or more conditions that are known to be associated with increased cardiometabolic risk and mortality. So for example, a very high hemoglobin A1C, over eight on two or more oral medications, it's very well established that high A1Cs are strongly associated with increased risk of microvascular and macrovascular events in diabetes. Use of insulin is strongly associated with mortality, so that, so that should be a criterion for expedited access. Obviously, a known history of cardiovascular disease You've had one heart attack, the chances of having another are much higher. NASH is strongly associated with multiple cardiometabolic risks, or, and so that, that would be on the list, or two or more additional non-diabetes metabolic complications known to be associated with cardiovascular risk, say dyslipidemia and hypertension as examples. Albuminuria and stage three to four chronic kidney disease are incredibly strong proxies for increased cardiovascular event rate. So we put them on the list, 
And finally, we prioritize surgery in people whose diabetes is five years or more. We didn't want to go with 10 years or more because it's known that the longer your diabetes is around, the less likely it is to remit after metabolic surgery, and the remission rates begin to fall off heavily at 10 years. Who should get standard access to surgery in the diabetes domain? Well, folks who don't have those, have those conditions. So their A1C is below eight. They only take oral medications, no, no insulin. They don't have a history of cardiovascular disease. They have one or fewer other metabolic condition that poses cardiovascular risk. They don't have microalbuminuria or any other significant in, uh, evidence of microvascular disease. Now let's talk about obesity surgery. And again, we'll divide people into those who deserve expedited access versus they should get standard access. Conditions we thought would qualify for expedited access are a BMI over 60. So people in that very, very heavy group suffer all manner of complications, even if they don't have diabetes. Once again, NASH, or more than two other metabolic conditions associated with the cardiovascular disease with expedite surgery. Folks in this very heavy category often have obstructive sleep apnea that's severe and or obesity hypoventilation syndrome. And there's a very strong correlation between those and mortality. So we put those on the list for expedited access. People who have heart failure of AHA category C or higher, and again, stage three to four chronic kidney disease. That all would give you expedited access what about the opposite? Standard access would be for people who don't have this. BMI is under 60. They have fewer, two, two or fewer other metabolic diseases. They only have mild sleep troubles or a little bit of arthritis. Now, adjuvant bariatric metabolic surgery, we define that as something which allows you to get to another operation that you critically need. So for example, you're dying and you need an organ transplant, but the, the surgeon won't do you unless you lose hundred pounds. So metabolic bariatric surgery could then allow this person to get a new organ to save his or her life. This is a very compelling reason to expedite metabolic surgery or to, to accelerate or facilitate another operation like a coronary artery bypass graft or a sorely needed replacement of hip or knee. All of those conditions we consider deserving of expedited access. So this is our algorithm. I know it's very complex, but um, hopefully it will be published soon. It's being reviewed under a very expedited mechanism. I'll finish by just mentioning the two highlights that I think you should take home. One is after the COVID pandemic, in tackling the bariatric metabolic surgery backlog, patients should be prioritized based on the burden of diseases that are most likely to hurt them and most likely to be ameliorated by surgery rather than primarily on the old standard of BMI. And then the most important thing that I want to say is that although this triaging algorithm will be especially germane shortly after the COVID-19 pandemic, when we're working through that backlog, there is absolutely no reason why it couldn't be used to guide clinically meaningful prioritization long into the future and much more logically than the old BMI standards. This was a group effort. These are the authors on our paper. I'm the senior author, Francesco Rubino is the first uh, together with Ricardo Cohen, we took the lead on the, on the writing, although with critical intellectual input from the other world leaders that are shown here. I thank them very much for their work and you for your kind attention. And I'm all finished. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And it's back to you guys. Thank you, Professor Cummings. It was a great presentation. We look forward to seeing this article published live and helping us globally to uh, prioritize weight loss surgeries, especially as we are initially a weight loss surgery academic group uh, globally. So uh, moving on to our next, uh, we will go into some questions and answers at, at the end of the presentations. I wanna present uh, the next uh, speaker, insights of the impact of COVID-19 on the South Asian population with metabolic syndrome. This is Professor Pradeep Chaubi from India. Professor, it's a great honor to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm honored to be here. Uh, I would uh, like to discuss about our uh, we generally, we discuss about Asian subcontinent, but uh, I'm specifically uh, trying to discuss about the South Asian because we are quite different. So if you really look at, of course, I bring greetings uh, from New Delhi, India, 
And uh, of course, as you have just mentioned, that uh, my presentation will be on the uh, insight of uh, the academics, um, the COVID infection. Can I change the slide? Uh, can you see it? Yes, please. Okay, so um, we all know that I think the whole world is uh, uh, affected by COVID-19 problem. And this is the Asian map, which you can see the large 60% uh, uh, mass is there, the land mass is uh, in Asia. But what I will be discussing and concentrating more on South Asia, which India being the largest uh, country, we have uh, Pakistan, we have got Bangladesh, we have got Nepal, and also we have included Sri Lanka to this. Now, if you really look at this, we have got almost about 22 to 23% of the world's population living uh, in this uh, southern part of uh, Asia. But, well, to uh, our pleasant surprise, we still have less than 25,000, uh, uh, approximately 25,000 patients. Uh, as it on 20th last uh, night, the calculations which have been there. And also, interestingly, we have less than 1,000 mortalities. So uh, it also gives us the view that there may be something different with us. And uh, I would like to see how things are different uh, with this uh, uh, continent. If you look at the epi epidemiology, you will see that, um, of course, this region is very densely populated, and uh, we have metabolic uh, syndromes at uh, even lower BMI. And as you all know, that uh, Asians, our BMI cutoff is 2.5 less than the Western standards. That also means that we have obese patients and having the comorbidity like a pre-diabetic, diabetes, um, sleep apnea, et cetera, but we also have metabolic problems with uh, even average weight or overweight weight also. That means that we have a bigger metabolic syndrome population as compared to the obesity problem. The Chinese experience has shown that uh, COVID infection with metabolic syndrome is a sinister combination, which uh, brings really very, very poor outcomes. Patients suffer a lot, a longer period, and they go through quite a bit of rough uh, phase of the disease. And they also acquire it a little uh, early. So the metalysis done by 46,248 cases in China confirms what exactly uh, it is. Now, if you really look at that, we're talking of young obese patients, the patients with age less than 60, and their hospitalization rate between 30 and 35 BMI is twice than the average uh, population, average weighing person. If the BMI goes beyond 35, of course, it is even more, but the problem is of the critical care, which goes up to 3.6 uh, times more for these patients. Now, I think many times, uh, uh, you know, you must be reading about it that India is doing less number of tests. Yes, certainly with the uh, population of India, uh, 1.3 billion, so it's not possible to test so many persons, neither the kits are available, neither the logistical it is possible. But if you really look at when you do 100 cases, investigate them, how many are positive? So if you can look at the chart, India, I think out of 100, we get 4.4 patients as positive patients as compared to Pakistan, which is 9%, Bangladesh is 8, Sri Lanka is 6. So you see the lower range in the Asia Pacific region. The moment you move on to West, USA, you get 
out of 100, you get almost 19 patients positive. And France is 22%. Spain is even bad. I mean, it's worse, 28 cases are positive. And Italy, of course, we all know, 24%. So India definitely is doing, in this subcontinent, we are doing lesser cases. But at the same time, we have got lesser positive cases also. And I'm sure I will like to discuss a little bit uh, on, on this issue. And uh, let's see, our what are the facts of our subcontinent? How these two, three months which have gone, what we have done. First of all, I think India did a very early lockdown. And I, I will discuss all these points uh, um, in, in uh, coming presentation. Another point comes about BC vaccination. Then we discuss about the SCQ prophylaxis as well as treatment. Partial herd immunity is, is it there? Well, because Asian subcontinent, India has got a younger population as compared to the Western, where there are more senior population. And of course, ambient high temperature, temperate climate, which has shown in India and also in Vietnam, etc. Now look at the Indian timelines, you know, because we are very accurate on that. The suspected, we suspended visa on 13th March when we had just a couple of hundred cases uh, uh, in, in the whole country. Then we stopped the arrival and departure of national and international on 19th March, on day 49, after our first case was reported on 30th January in southern part of India. We stopped all public transportation within 52 days after the first case was recorded. Then there was so-called Janta curfew, which was announced for a day on Sunday, just as a sort of trailer to see how uh, things behave. And first lockdown was on 53 days after the first case was, positive case was detected. Then the lockdown was again extended on 75th day. And now we have got a lockdown up to 3rd of May, which will complete 40 days of lockdown. Now you see how it has brought benefit or so-called lesser problems. Before black down, um, uh, lockdown, our doubling rate was three days. Then after lockdown, the doubling rate every was six days. At the moment, today morning, the, according to our statistics, our uh, doubling time is 7.5 days. At the end, when we finish on 3rd May, it is projected their doubling time of uh, 11 days you should be able to achieve. Now, very quick glance on the um, diagrammatic sort of thing. The first day, 31st January, the one, now case number one was detected. Then we went on 2nd March, that was 32 days after the first case, we went uh, up to confirmed cases of five, just five cases in 32 days in such a vast country. We moved on to 13th March and we had 81 uh, confirmed cases. And this was day 43 after the first case. Then we moved on 50th day, 20th March, and we had 244 cases in the population of 1.3 billion. On 21st, the D date was 53rd day after the first case, and we had 415 cases in the whole country. And that is the day when we had the complete lockdown of the country. And on 2nd uh, April, of course, it was uh, 2,000 cases as we see doubling, and then uh, extended lockdown was called for on 19th April. At the moment today, yesterday night at 1045, we have 17,615 cases. Of course, uh, 2,854 have recovered and deaths are uh, 559. The typical problem the country faced during this period was migratory population. It is the labor, daily wages, who migrate from one uh, lesser, uh, uh, economically uh, lesser uh, um, strong states to the metros. So the problem was how to control them because they want to go back to their state 
which may be a couple of hundred kilometers, maybe two or three thousand kilometers away from the place where they are working. So what was their problem? In our assessment, food was not really a problem. Maybe for a day it was a problem, but the government provided food and shelter to all of them. The wages, of course, they were not getting. So the government of India provided in their bank uh, about 5,000 uh, rupees in their bank for their expenses. But the biggest problem was their homesickness. We, you know, then Asians, we are quite, you know, family oriented and living in a joint family with grandparents and the parents. So this was the main reason. And, but fortunately, it has settled over a period of time. Now, I think uh, very quickly, BCG vaccination, what is our observation? What we have seen, wherever the countries have vaccinated, the COVID chances are 38.4 per million population, whereas the death, death rate is 4.28 million per, uh, the two, uh, 4.28 per million. Whereas wherever the vaccination has not been done as compulsory, the, it really jumps maybe 10 times the, uh, the chances of COVID infection and very, very high mortality. There is no uh, scientific reason why we are talking about it, but this is an observation. HSQ, I think uh, we all know that it does not um, uh, kill the virus or reduce the number of virus. But in uh, smaller studies, it has also shown the largest studies from, from China, 150 patients, which has definitely shown that the white blood count goes up and the CRP level goes down. And this is what helps in reducing their stay in the hospital and also sometimes uh, uh, the early discharge and a better recovery and lesser suffering. Just coming to my last couple of uh, this thing, we are also talking about the partial herd immunity because India had uh, uh, the issues related with COVID series of viruses like dengue fever, the chicken gonia, and many types of influenza. So is there some herd uh, immunity uh, to uh, us, which may be partial in nature, which reduces the um, number? And uh, these are my final slides. Today is all yesterday night at 10.45. You can see USA uh, at the highest level. And India, you see, is about 16,100 uh, cases and as compared to 4.49 uh, uh, million uh, in other countries. So you can see the Western population is having more number of cases. And also you will see that there are more deaths in the Western world as compared to our densely populated, populated uh, countries. And also, if you see the uh, investigations in the positive cases, which you get after doing 100 uh, investigations, you can say that India after 100, you can just get, which I have already discussed that you get 4.4 positive cases. Now, this is my last slide. I think, unfortunately, uh, in our society, what we are battling is the stigma of having a COVID positive uh, uh, level uh, on the assessment. This unfortunately is true even for the medical professionals, the paramedical staff, the persons who are living in a rented place, if they're a doctor and medical people, there seems to be a stigma because they feel that, uh, and I'm sure only time will tell us how we have to believe, Government is taking all possible actions, are getting very, very strict on these things. And, and of course, we have some lights of hope at the end of the tunnel. We will see after 3rd May how the country and the subcontinent behaves when the lockdown is lifted. And we are keeping our fingers crossed. And I hope then by that time, we, will, we would flatten the curve. We will have more infrastructure available. We will have more hospitals equipped with uh, dealing with these COVID patients. And uh, once again, thank you very much. Uh, I would love to uh, answer your questions at the end of the session. Professor Chaubi, thank you again. It's always an honor and we're so happy that the news coming out of India is actually good news. Maybe we should be learning uh, something from 
your uh, country's organization and effectiveness in preventing the spread of the COVID-19. So yes, there definitely will be questions at the end of the sessions, but now we want to move on to should we be deferring elective esophageal and gastric cancer surgery during the COVID-19 pandemic? And this is my present, uh, our pres presenting Dr. Ken Loy from Australia with the following talk. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Dr. Ken, okay. wonderfully. Welcome. Thank you. Um, sorry, it's a bit husky. Um, just to echo on to Professor Charby's presentation, a lot of people actually now want to come to Australia because we only so far today got 71 deaths and 6,000 patients tested. And we're probably the first country that banned flight from China since February. And thanks to the social lockdown, we're able to keep the number down. I guess as upper GI and bariatric surgeries, we with this low number, a lot of our colleagues, in fact, stopping elective surgery and twiddling the thumbs and waiting for things to get back up. So I'm just going to share my thoughts in terms of what we should be doing. Um, but this doesn't apply just to me, but it's probably a simple algorithm that you can apply to most of the thinkings on cancer. So I'll share my screen now, just while I'm loading up. I guess for us is we actually in sort of have strict lockdown very early and I think that factors into social distancing and we actually, besides all the measures that uh, Professor Chalby mentions, and there is actually police issuing $5,000 fines for people who are breaching the law. And that's probably something that scare people off as well. Um, but in terms of cancer surgery, as you know, cancers, everyone, when they get diagnosed, they get anxious, the families get uptight and they want the treatment, et cetera, et cetera. And when they get told that, you know, coming into a hospital that you may potentially contact COVID or all the other risk factors that's involved, they get scared. So let's not forget that cancers is not just the treatment itself. It's actually a stage of pathway. If you can see, it's actually from diagnosis. If you stop doing endoscopy, you're not going to diagnose cancer. And if you delay investigation by PET scan, CT scan, because they're not available of contrast or whatever, the special material that they use for PET scan importing from other countries, you're going to get delayed diagnosis. Then you get treatment in terms of endoscopy, people, you know, endoscopic um, guys are quite worried about doing aerosolization. Um, sort of uh, process and therefore leading towards afterwards people that who are undergoing neoadjuvant therapy and they are due for the operations and how do you manage or palliate patient as well either in hospital or out of hospital because this group are very vulnerable so I have a simple concept for you guys it's called CNS so what is mean by C is you've got to look at your country you look at your cancer case load then you can determine what sort of problem you're facing with um, throwing all these cancers into the mix of upper GI or bariatric surgery. I guess you guys all know this graph. Um, Japan, Australia, and Korea, we are very fortunate in the sense that we don't have too much disease. We don't have too much death. We have time to gear up for PPE. We have time to gear up for ventilator. So there is capacity probably to do some of the elective or what we call category one or category two surgery. So for us, it's a, it's a really good thing. But for a lot of the country or my colleagues in Europe and American, all our understanding is when they're facing the fact that they're running out of ventilators or PPE, none of the other surgery can be done. So this is for you to decide in terms of your hospital, your country, where you're living in, what caseload you are dealing with. So you determine how you engage patients in terms of talking to them. So this is two days ago. The other simple concept I always teach my fellow registrars, uh, I've got a small brain, I only remember three things. So C and N and S. So N is the network that you have. So if you work in a hospital that are linked with major hospital that you can refer cases on, or if your hospital become a, a full on COVID hospital, your patients that you want to treat, either you go to another hospital that is non-COVID uh, positive or maybe less COVID patients or have the available resources. So you may have to be flexible in terms of how you 
going to treat the patients in terms of where they're going to go as well. So that's obviously applied on different country. So I guess, I mean, using England as an example, Australia is not very well organized. I think England and United States had a very good pattern of referral or even Japan as well. The cancers are quite centralized in terms of area of treatment. So this obviously helped. So I think government will need to put into resources so to ensure that this hospital that treating cancers are probably segregated from treating uh, some of the sick COVID patients just to avoid cost contamination. Um, even people sitting in the corridors. One, one of our um, prime example is in Melbourne that I think two of the cancer patients died uh, in a cancer center and then they contacted the COVID and they infected about 15 odd staff member associated with that as well. So it just tell you that this group are vulnerable. And if you look at epidemiology of gastric and esophageal cancer, um, gastric cancer is mostly around Russians, Asian area, and, and then South American area. And esophageal cancers, a lot are in Europe and so maybe around uh, United States and, you know, around the area. So all these are quite a country that have different resources and way to deal with the referral pattern. So know your network, have a few friends, call up the people that you know about sometime even you may have to let go or you know or refer the cases on to other people that who can help you to treat the cancer because your hospital just simply overrun by all the other patients is an important consideration so so this is not the time for ego this is not the time for being the champion or try to hold on to your patient the patient come first the patient need to be treated appropriately in appropriate institute with the minimal risk in the best of hand. And in fact, um, in training, I think our fellow registrar, I would say sadly disappointingly, this year probably going to write off their training because the hospital also will mandate a lot of our major surgery being done by our consultant rather than actually being um, you know, done by fellow. Maybe they'll be able to do part of it, but it's all about time of surgery, all about minimizing complication and get them in hospital and get them out of hospital early. So that's the main considerations. And I guess the last things about SS is about surgeon or the surgery that you're going to do. So everyone is a good surgeon. I have no doubt, right? If I tell someone that they're a bad surgeon, they're going to kill me. So. I think surgeon wise, this type of operation is probably best to be done by the people that who had done a lot. This, I think, you know, ego or not ego, you have to forego that. And what type of surgery, how you're going to do it is going to be important as well. I think in fact, um, a lot of people are anxious, but there actually is a lot of evidence that on the open surgery, in fact, sometimes delaying some of the cancers are not such a bad thing. Because sadly speaking, I guess the cure rate of COVID virus is quite high, but the cure rate, the, the cure rate, not sorry, sorry of my Chinese, the cure rate of the cancer surgery is also quite high as well. So we have to be sensible. Some of these people that present to you probably got a five year survival of 5% or even 10%. So um, it's not saying that we're denying treatment, but there are enough evidence such as in UK published that in fact, sometimes delaying on surgical treatment is actually allow you to observe the tumor biology to select it out the patients that should probably undergo surgery rather than operating on some of the patients that probably going to disseminate as well. And you then wasting all the precious resources to treat the complications that could be using that to save people or using the ventilator to save a few people as well. I mean, give you an example, my COVID positive patients that actually come in and end up having cholecystitis because it's got turned back on emergency three times because the chest is clear and end up to be a cholecystitis, end up on the ventilator for about three weeks and manage to get off the ventilator. But if the resources is not there, these people will face a very hard choice in terms of who's going to use the ventilator or not. Just one example. Just one example that I can share with you. And in fact, in Japan's um, also experience on treating early gastric cancer, if you look at the progress on cancers, in fact, um, in early cancer, they are not that quick, especially a symptomatic one. You're talking about the top end that even delaying about 30 months of treatment 
the chances of um, of uh, the, the death rate in terms of comparing delay surgery versus surgery is actually not much difference. It's only you're talking about if you delay the operation for more than a few years, then it may really affecting their prognosis. So there are some saying about everyone is different and every cancer you need to evaluate with your oncology team in terms of how the best way to treat it as well. And in, in, uh, in um, Andy Anderson, they actually also have article that published that in fact, a lot of the advanced gastric cancers probably um, doesn't make much of a difference unless they are uh, symptomatic that you need to treat it. If they are asymptomatic, then the, the, the success rate of treatment is probably not much difference if you have a four or five weeks delay of the treatment only. And this is depending on country, I guess, um, a lot of the countries are peaking early and therefore probably going to finish early. But in our Australia, we actually are modeling that I'm helping my government to actually model is actually going to be at least until uh, August or maybe October before there's going to be a peak. So if during the meantime, how we're going to survive, how we're going to choose patient to operate is important for us. So I think actually um, IBC to asking me to dig it out so we can help our government on that. And, and in that article on MD Anderson, they do show that, that if they operated on symptomatic patients, when they look at the survival rate, in fact, it's worse. So there is pretty much case by case for asymptomatic patient if they being treated and watch and wait for a couple of weeks so until there's some resources, uh, until the peak is over, then it's not unreasonable as well. I mean, talking about surgery itself, we all know that nowadays everything is minimal invasive. I think Thomas do a lot of robotic um, surgery as well. And a lot of people jumping on board to do robotic minimal invasive esophagectomy. There is actually a very good uh, meta-analysis that got together all the evidence. And I think there's only two articles that is randomized. Um, one is by Italy and one is by China. They all do show that, that if it's done by properly by consultants, um, the length of stay is less, the pulmonary complication is less. So obviously less chances of getting, uh, the, getting onto the ventilator and wasting resources. So that I'm happy to share for you guys afterwards. But to, I think to summarize the other thing is, this is very, very individualized topic. You, you cannot use one box to fit into different country and different country need to have their own algorithm. The cancer center need to unify, need to actually um, centralize disease to be treated, which I guess is a lot of country are doing it well, but a lot of the country are not able to do well as well. So there may be death associated with it. Um, and just to sum up for the CNS, in fact, just to reiterate, just use your brain. That is very simple concept. Use your brain to treat the disease. So I thank you very much for asking me to do the talk. Thank you so much for that update. Uh, it's great news as well to hear how Australia is doing, my friend. Uh, thank you, Ken, Loy, everyone. And uh, following on the in the next uh, presentation, the topic is what is considered optimal personal protective equipment for surgeons undertaking laparoscopic and open abdominal surgery on the COVID-19 positive patient in China. Professor Charles Penzang, welcome to this live cast. Okay, thank you, Ariel, for the introduction. Let me share my screen. Okay, uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity to share some of our surgical practice and uh, uh, my personal thoughts. My name is Charles Pinjiang from Beijing, China. I'm the chief of metabolic bariatric surgery at the Capital Medical, Medical University, Beijing Friendship Hospital. And uh, I don't have any disclosures. So this, uh, this data was extracted from the World Health Organization. As of today, there are a total of more than 2.3 million confirmed COVID cases in the world. And uh, 160,000 persons died from COVID. Uh, this number is still escalating very quickly. <clears throat> Based on CDC's respiratory disease mathematical model, the pattern of uh, COVID-19 outbreak can be divided into pre-pandemic intervals and pandemic intervals. Uh, people need to 
need some time to re uh, recognize this new disease. In pandemic interval, uh, the outbreak lasts for about uh, four phases, including the initiation, acceleration, deceleration, and then the preparation for the uh, resuming normal life. And uh, uh, this out outbreak outlier in China, as of today, there are a total of 84,000 confirmed cases and uh, 4,600 deaths uh, during the past few months. Uh, we have fit the mathematical model onto the outbreak of uh, timeline China very well. And uh, uh, we can see we can see during the uh, late December last year, the outbreak was initiating. Uh, between mid-January and mid-February, the outbreak accelerated quickly and uh, reached a plateau, which it peaked in mid-February, then started decelerating uh, till mid-March. Uh, then mid-March is the end of outbreak. In the, on the on the January 23rd here, the epicenter, which is Wuhan, was locked down. And two days later, it was Chinese New Year. So the, in the whole country, elective surgery uh, discontinued. And uh, starting, and which discontinued for about two months and starting from uh, March 16, which is the end of the decelerating uh, phase of outbreak, some cities resume elective surgery, including Beijing, but patients need to be uh, screened for COVID-19 before the mission. Uh, on, on, on the... Uh, on the April 7th, and uh, you know the Wuhan had, was reopened, but we still need uh, uh, we, we still need patients to be uh, screened before any surgery procedures. And uh, and the first I would talk would like to talk about our practice during the acceleration the deceleration period of time. We classify surgical procedures into three categories, which is emergency surgery semi-elective surgery and the elective surgeries based on the urgency. And uh, emergency surgery means that it, it, some delay may cause uh, damage to a patient's health or even loss of life. And, uh, and also we classify uh, the patients into three cohorts. And the cohort A is uh, suspected or confirmed COVID patients. And cohort B is pa patients under quarantine during due to close con contact with COVID RNA positive patients and the cohort C confirmed without any infections. Uh, here is uh, some example uh, of emergency surgery, including patients in the hemorrhage shock or septic shock and uh, perforate vis viscous and uh, airway emergencies and uh, risks of ischemic bowel and specifically for bariatric surgery, some emergency surgery, surgery examples include perforated marginal ulcer, bleeding, acute anastomotic or staple line leak, obstruction, particular uh, internal hernia, and uh, gastric band perforation or prolapse. And uh, uh, for patients in the emergent, emergent or urgent condition, we need to classify patient cohorts at first. If the patient is classified into cohort C, meaning no infection, the patient can go at, can undergo surgery directly. And if patient is classified as cohort uh, B, cohort B, then the, the condition can be uh, divided into the either, either semi-elective or emergency life-saving procedures. And the further semi-elective, we need to the further uh, testing for the COVID, if they become suspend, uh, suspect or confirmed, then the surgery is going to be postponed. If confirmed no infection, the patient can undergo surgery uh, directly. And, uh, and uh, if the patient in the emergency life saving condition, they can go to emergency surgery. And for a patient in the cover A, if patient is in the uh, condition in the elective or semi-elective surgery condition, then they're going to cancel or postpone surgery until they become negative in the COVID. And if they in the emergency, emergency uh, condition, we're going to do emergency surgery. Uh, you know, proper, proper PPEs are needed for these surgeries. For level one protection for non-infected patients here, and the level two or three 
uh, protections are needed for the patient with uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, positive or suspect patients who need emergency surgery. This, uh, this uh, table, table showing the level of PPEs. Level one PPE is like what we do every day in OR, in normal life. For level two and level three, and uh, shoe covers and, uh, and the safety glasses or face shield are needed. And, uh, and we need, uh, uh, also need a protective coverall suit and uh, either need N95 masks or higher, or even for level three, we need a full face respiratory. Uh, <clears throat> when treating uh, COVID pos uh, positive patients, protection to be enforced from transfer patient to OR, in OR, after operation, during recovery, all the way up to going home. And uh, the goal of protection is that to protect our patients, protect ourselves, our coworkers, our family members and relatives. So uh, this is the, our practice uh, for all the protections. Uh, um, when transporting patient to OR, patient need to be checked in the checking the, uh, in the designated outpatient examine areas, for instance, the fever clinic. And, uh, and also we need to use the designated patient transporting route. Yeah, in the hospital, you're going to this designate which route is going to transport the positive patients. And the appropriate PPE is during transporting, including patient should be fully covered and the surgical face masks, face shield, and the disposable surgical cap are needed for the transporting personnel. And then they need a level two or level three protection. Uh, you need a protective cover, suite, shoe cover, double gloves, and 95 masks, and the face shield and uh, all, all eye protection. And uh, after just follow patient transfer, uh, transporting, the, uh, they need to spray disinfected, is following the route with a uh, chlorine containing disinfectant. And also, if the elevator are used, then going to disinfect the elevator right away. When when inside OR and uh, the negative pressure OR is strongly recommended, and uh, uh, going to have minimal number of personnel in OR, the no vi visitors or observers are uh, recommended, and a level two or level three protection required, uh, and then the. Especially for the intubation risks, surgeons and the personnel not needed for intubation should remain outside the OR until anesthesia, induction, and the intubation are completed. And uh, we, for, for the procedure, we're going to, we need to consider avoiding laparoscopy or endoscopic procedures. And, uh, and also need to minimize the use of electro, electrocautery and ultrasonic device uh, in the and uh, we, we, we need it for use a low, if needed, we use a low power setting and uh, avoid is the long uh, dissection times. And also we, after at the end of procedure, we need to minimize the use of drainage tube, urinary catheter, nasal gastric or oral gastric tube, and also uh, minimize use of the gastric feeding tube. If, if you have to do a, a, if the laparoscopic surgery cannot be avoided, then uh, when we do the surgery, the laparoscopic suction is recommended to remove surgical plumb and uh, desuffilate the abdominal cavity and uh, use lower into abdominal pressure like 10 to 12 millimeter mercury if feasible and uh, uh, to avoid rapid desuffilation of uh, pneumoperitoneum. And uh, when you do the specimen extraction, this should be done uh, cautiously with minimum CO2 escape and, uh, and try to minimize blood fluid droplets spray or spread. And also need to uh, check the seals of chalkers in order to minimize the leakage of the CO2. And uh, after the surgery, for the cohort A patients, and uh, which is a uh, suspected or positive patient, need to be transferred to the designated room or even to a designated COVID uh, hospital. And for cohort B patient, so you cannot decide whether patient positive or not. You now usually with our practice to, to just wait for uh, for RNA, RNA test for the PCR test in the OR. If negative, then transfer back to the uh, ward. 
And if the uh, RNA test is positive, we need to transfer a patient to the designated room or hospital. Yeah, if we cannot confirm when we are waiting in the OR, then treat as a cohort patients. And, uh, and uh, the personnel need to change PPEs when exiting OR and all the disposables uh, should be contained and uh, use a minimum number of transport personnel uh, with PPEs. Now during the recovery uh, period, in a, a single isolated patient room is recommended. And uh, for, for that room, you uh, need to designate personnel like doctors or nurses, they, they need to uh, specify for that room. Uh, they, they should wear level two PPEs and the uh, uh, rapid recovery protocol is preferred. Uh, and uh, do not discharge patient until uh, COVID PCR test become undetectable for two consecutive times uh, before they're going home. The two tests should be uh, have interval longer than 24 hours. Uh, based on the mathematical model in China, we now in this period, which is in the preparation phase. So we need to work on resuming to normal life. So, uh, so we are now in this phase. And, uh, and uh, starting from this phase, the elective surgery, we, can, we resumed elective and semi-elective surgery uh, since Mar uh, mid-March. But, but every patient needs to be screened before the mission. If negative, then there, there's no restriction for elective surgeries. And if patient is confirmed or con suspected uh, COVID patient, then the surgical procedure for the elective and the semi-elective procedure need to be postponed until they become negative. If we cannot decide whether positive or negative, then uh, just wait for another two weeks and uh, rescreen the patient, then, uh, uh, then decide whether to do the surgery or not. And for this, for the, uh, for the healthy patient, for the non infect patient level one, PPE is still recommended. So this is our uh, screening protocol. And uh, we need to uh, uh, ask the travel history of each patient. And uh, if he, he has a uh, close contact with any positive patients. Now, and also we, we're going to uh, take the same terms like uh, whether a patient has fever, cough, shortness of breath, et cetera. And I'm going to do the blood test for CBC and a CRP and do a chest CT. And uh, if suspected, then we're going to do the PCR test. And any positive patient just, just hold on hold for surgery and uh, their uh, screen is negative, going to do the surgery. All right, that's my talk. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh Professor Charles Peng Zhang, thank you for this presentation. And in fact, I'm gonna ask two things of our live viewers. If you are viewing right now, post your questions on Facebook and YouTube platforms. We will be reviewing them and then having our guests answer them at the end of this following talk. I also wanna direct your attention to Spotlight on Industry segment, which will air immediately after the questions and answer segments. Today we have Gary Teagan from ConMed Corporation, specifically talking about what Dr. Peng has just presented, which is smoke evacuation and insufflation equipment and devices. So this is Gary Teagan from ConMed Corp, and this is Spotlight on Industry segment immediately after the questions and answers. And thank you again to our presenter. And now the final topic, which is COVID-19 and its impact on post-operative complications with Professor Aurora Pryor. Uh, Aurora, welcome to this live cast. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the invitation to speak today. Um, what we're gonna talk a little bit about is SARS-CoV-2. And for me, this is particularly relevant. I practice on Long Island in New York and we actually have the highest prevalence of COVID infection in the US. So this is something we see every day in our hospital. Um, my disclosures are not particularly relevant uh, for today's talk. So let's talk a little bit about the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And really, if you can see it in patients who aren't coming in with symptoms, because I think this is 
important as we do surgery on these patients. And there's two particular settings that have been tested really with asymptomatic patients. And one was the Diamond Princess cruise ship, which docked in Hong Kong, and they screened everybody who came off that ship. So they all had reasonable exposure and they had between 18 and 50% positivity of the asymptomatic people from the boat or from the other place that did asymptomatic testing, which was in Sweden, essentially testing all comers. So I think it's something very relevant to us to be aware. Also, even with exposure, incubation to symptoms can take up to two weeks. So the other thing that's very relevant for us taking care of these people is that exposure is highest in the early age of the uh, exposure and infection and really within five days of symptom onset. So asymptomatic patients can expose our staff and can be very relevant. Um, also, if you put those people in the hospital and they're actually having an inpatient stay following a procedure, they can expose other patients as well. So what else is important when we're looking at bariatric patients? As Dr. Cummings mentioned earlier, both obese and diabetic patients are higher risk for infection with SARS-CoV-2, and they do worse if they get the COVID-19 infection. So I think the relevant things are surgical interventions can put our staff at risk and they can expose our patients. Well, does that really matter? Well, so what happens if you get COVID infection after surgery or if you are asymptomatic and you start to get symptoms after a procedure? There's not a lot of data. Um, there have been two published studies. This is probably the biggest one that comes out of China, looking at 34 patients that underwent elective surgery while unknowingly COVID positive. All of those patients, it makes sense that's how they were picked up, but they developed COVID-19 pneumonia shortly post-op. Common symptoms were the typical infection symptoms of fever, fatigue, and dry cough, but symptoms can impact beyond that. You can get hypoxia, you can get GI symptoms, you can have a hypercoagulable state that ends up causing microinfarction and may cause other complications. And then the worse off patients are gonna have pulmonary and eventually cardiovascular collapse. They saw 44% of these people that had symptomatic infections required admission to the ICU and they had a 20% mortality. So if we're trying to minimize complications to our patient post-op, Obviously you don't want them presenting and experiencing a COVID infection. Um, this is another series published from the Cleveland Clinic, but the patients were out of Tehran. The four procedures were cholecystectomy, hernia repair, gastric bypass, and hysterectomy. What's interesting is the bypass patient didn't actually have surgery. Um, they were preparing for surgery and actually presented to the emergency department and had a fatal arrest the night before operation when they were asymptomatic beyond that day. So if their surgery had been one day um, earlier, they would have ended up having uh, essentially that arrest post-op. They had a cholecystectomy and hernia patient that had post-op symptoms and ended up dying. And then the hysterectomy patient who also had a cholecystectomy had symptoms but survived. So of their small series, these were really serious complications, which obviously none of us want our patients to experience. So what we've done in a higher prevalence area is that we have halted all elective surgeries. I have personally operated on a couple bariatric emergencies as were pointed out earlier, marginal ulcer and internal hernia. And I think those kind of things you have to take care of because without surgery, those patients are gonna have a bad outcome. We do use smoke evacuation and do procedures laparoscopically um, because I do think if you could actually manage that surgical smoke with the appropriate devices, that laparoscopy may be safer, although there's really no great data to show us either way. Um, and you do have to have the right PPE. So for us in our hospital, that's an N95 mask for all patients um, because our testing is imperfect at this point in time. So I can't tell you for sure that everybody's negative who has no symptoms. Um, we do try to test everybody preoperatively, and we do have PCR in-house, but it takes about 12 hours. So some patients are not going to have time to have that testing come back. Ideally, all staff is going to be tested. And I think as we expand to doing surgery again more electively, that regular staff screening is important too to minimize the exposure to our patients. And probably that's gonna be at least weekly, um, but we'll have to see how that pans out and what the resources are that are available. 
the other thing that we're gonna need to do to make sure this is safe is to segregate COVID-19 patients, staff, and post-operative care entirely. We're talking at my institution about potentially setting up our ambulatory surgery center as a COVID-free hospital. I think cancer hospitals can be set up that way potentially also. Um, we've talked about using a unit that is contiguous with our OR for potentially being a COVID-free area, but, but minimizing crossing of paths, I think is gonna be the way to minimize exposure. The other thing that we've done for COVID positive patients, and we have a protocol that's published, you can find it on the SAGES site, um, is an anticoagulation protocol. And we've found that this has really helped us with our survivability of our COVID positive patients that have ended up in the hospital. Um, because those micro infarcts are a problem. So we, we follow the D-dimers and anticoagulate to help really minimize any of the vascular complications. Other resources online that I think are very, very helpful if you're trying to make decisions on these patients, um, SAGES and EAES did some recommendations together that are on our website and will be published in Surgical Endoscopy, but you can access those at the web link shown here. And the American College of Surgeons has some really great resources too in a variety of different categories, including advocacy as well. So I think those are worth looking at and are helpful for information. Um, so in general, the summary of what I went through is that these can be really sick patients post-op and we really wanna try to minimize post-operative infection in our patients because the complications can be severe. The keys to this are really good testing, isolation from potentially infected patients and providers, and really appropriate safety to minimize any transmissibility. So again, thank you, Dr. Ortiz, for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Aurora Pryor, Professor. Uh, it's a great uh, privilege to have you here. And before we go into our questions and answers that is gonna be uh, moderated by Professor Tom Rogula, I just wanna remind everyone that the May 5th event is coming up. This is a global event. And uh, the topics are mathematical modeling, medical treatment, and vaccine develop development. And you will be able to watch these on, at ibcclub.org, Facebook, and YouTube in our social media. All right, going on to the questions and answers. Uh, Tom, are we ready for uh, the in initial questions that we have from our viewers? First of all, I want to thank you all speakers. There was absolutely a fantastic uh, experience to hear your, your, your experience. And just want to remind you, uh, so far we have 797 viewers from uh, 38 countries from all over the world. And uh, because our time is quite limited, uh, I will move to the first question coming from our um, good friend and, and co-chair of uh, IBC, Professor Harry Squadra from London. Uh, his question is for uh, Professor Chobi, and he's asking, uh, what is the current impression amongst the Indian medical establishment about the role of uh, hydroxychloroquine for prophylaxis and treatment of COVID-19? Professor Chobi? Yeah, um, uh, thanks, Harris. And uh, Tom, uh, our protocol at the moment is uh, to have a loading. Uh, I'm talking of the medical and paramedical personnel who are coming uh, in contact or in the hospital, may not be coming even in contact with the direct uh, patients, but uh, uh, ICMR, Indian Council of Medical Research, it uh, has advocated uh, uh, one single dose of uh, 400 milligram of HCQ uh, twice a day on day one, and then 200, uh, 400 uh, milligram every week for about six weeks. And uh, this is the protocol which we are following. While the patients are uh, uh, COVID positive, so we are giving them uh, 400 morning, evening for five to seven days. So this is, uh, non-COVID as well as COVID uh, protocol. And also I'm very happy to share with you all that uh, uh, three days back, um, India's first patient uh, who received plasma in my uh, institution uh, on compassionate ground, and uh, uh, he showed dramatic results. And within five days, he was uh, 
out of uh, uh, ventilator and also uh, showed two consecutive uh, negative results. So this is India's first uh, 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 patient uh, who has shown good results and uh, hopefully this might be a good uh, patients in the future. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, mm. We had some problems hearing at the very end of, of your talk. Uh, maybe just the last two sentences if you can repeat. So briefly, as I said, uh, for medical and a paramedical, for medical and the, is it okay? Yes, now yes. it's good. Yeah. So it is for medical and paramedical. We are giving uh, two doses uh, on day one of 400. SCQ and every week for six weeks. And uh, the last thing which I mentioned was the country's first patient in my institution. We have given uh, plasma therapy and uh, the patient uh, in five days came out of the ventilator and two consecutive tests have shown uh, COVID negative and uh, we are very happy and we are actually a little excited and we want to do a bigger studies uh, with uh, uh, other centers in India and abroad. Okay, thank, thank you so much. I think that was a very complete um, explanation. Um, if we can move to the next question, which comes from uh, Dr. Aparna Sinbaf, uh, who is watching us on our YouTube channel. Uh, her question is for Professor Charles. And she's um, asking, really enjoyed your lecture. Really want to know what um, evidence is suggesting laparoscopy increases, uh, I guess, uh, aerosol and uh, laparotomy does not. So if I understand, uh, Dr. Sinba is asking about evidence uh, for laparoscopy to increase risk in comparing to laparotomy, if I understand the question well. So Charles, can you can yeah. you bring some evidence on that? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. So far, we don't have direct evidence regarding whether laparoscopy procedure can increase the chance of infection of COVID, but uh, based on our, our guessing and uh, theoretically, it might increase the infection chance now because the, you know there's a fluid inside and the, and the pneumo peritonia the CO2 inside the abdominal cavity might be some contamination of the virus we worry about that so there is so far I, I don't I don't see any publication regarding whether the uh, laparoscopic procedure can increase uh, increase the uh, uh, chance of infection but uh, is that just our scientific guessing? Okay, very good. Marsh, may I also just weigh in as a second opinion? I'm not a surgeon, but in my research to put together this talk, I had the same impression. There is a theoretical risk of the pneumoperitoneum because it's a pressure system, positive pressure blowing potentially stuff from the patient out into the world. But there's no real actually evidence to compare the specific risk of contagion from a laparotomy versus a laparoscopy, both conceivably are risky. And I do think that if you add smoke evacuation or filtration of the pneumoperitoneum as you evacuate, that you can actually potentially make surgery a little bit safer by using laparoscopy. Agreed, and if you exactly. decompress the, the, the pneumoperitoneum slowly, mm -hmm. the, you know, just take the wind down. <laughs> Exactly. So at the end of uh, our questions and answer sessions, we've got a very interesting 
focus on the devices. There's these bigger devices and there's, there's actually extremely small devices uh, for virus filtration, which uh, can be readily available to any operating room. I have another question from Juan Pablo Pantoja in, in, in Mexico, and this is for the whole panel. And it's more like a comment. There is an initiative to change the term elective surgery for those patients that do not have emergency. The terms can be medically necessary or time-sensitive surgery, or medically necessary, not time-sensitive surgery. What's your opinion on this? Well, I think everything we do is medically necessary. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't, we shouldn't be doing it. Um, so I, I do agree that that's partially appropriate to change that terminology. Um, you know, I don't think there's really just three tiers either. I think what Dr. Cummings was alluding to is there's a lot of different considerations for every patient as we want to figure out what's the right order to be bringing these patients back into the operating room. So looking at all those factors, I think some patients are definitely emergent and some are less emergent, but still considered appropriate. Yeah. Just to share some examples. I would not say that elective is synonymous with optional. Optional surgery is on, I, I, I want to have a nose job, right? I mean, that you really can skip and nothing's going to happen. But if you say have, you know, bad metabolic disease and are BMI of 60, well, bariatric metabolic operation is elective in the sense you could do it today or you could do it a year from now, but it shouldn't be considered optional for a person like that. So it's definitely medically called for. I believe in Australia, when we shut down the elective surgery, um, then I think people start to get into the argument on what is category one, category two, category three. And even you're allowed to do category one and some urgent category two, like in my specialties, like gallbladders that are empyemas or gangrenous, whether you treat it with percutaneous cholecystostomy or operate on them. And then we hear about people that are doing urgent category one lipoma, which <laughs> I think, and then subsequently, then they seek the college guideline in terms of all the specialty. And within one week, we have 25 guidelines on different specialty and 10 of them are orthopedic on different joints on what is different category in different joints. <laughs> so it's just telling you how confusing things can be if we just categorizing things. At the end of the day, I think people got to remember it's a, it's a self-conscious things, I think. Okay, uh, I have another question, which uh, actually might be good for you, Ken. Uh, that comes from uh, my colleagues here from Poland, uh, Professor Piotr Richter and Professor Marek Szerzenga. Uh, they are uh, wondering if um, selective or routine chest CT scan is recommended uh, for screening uh, before elective, elective um, surgical oncology. Yeah, we, we have to um, look into that as well, because I think a lot of the time, most of the patients now come through with either chest abdominal problem, they score a CT scan of the abdomen, which usually allow you to look at the lower part of the chest. And in fact, I think there is article floating around saying about chest ultrasound, um, which is a more rapid way to diagnose it without any resources can be done in emergency by a lot of emergency physicians who are already good at handling trauma situation to do fast. So that also can be more rapid as well. And maybe resource-wise, um, resource maybe easier. Um, chest CT, yes, if I think it would show you the pattern, it diagnosed two of my patients that are presented with abdominal pain and end up to be COVID positive because of uh, chest changes, but they are also asymptomatic as well. But I don't think at the moment, in certainly in our country, it's recommended as routine, but a lot of physicians are doing it for the sake of when they're doing something else at the same time. I also like to answer on this, um, and this I admit is coming from my wife, who's a, a body imager. Uh, there's a problem with using chest CT as a method to diagnose COVID. It's, you know, it can work, but if you don't know what the results are before you put the person in, once they're through that CT scan, you got a, you got a dirty scanner and it's got to be treated as though it had a po positive COVID person in it um, for, you know, however long it takes to decontaminate that machine. It's a very disruptive thing to the workflow in a hospital. Um, so we hope to have, you know, wide distribution of the point of care 10 and 15 minute tests, you know, eventually so that you don't have to do that and contaminate a CT scanner or worry that it's contaminated and clean it for no good reason. 
Okay, no, very we, good. In, in, in our hospital, the CT scan is uh, still routine for every patient needs to be admitted to the hospital. So we find out that we, which is turn about, turnaround time is very quick. And then the other, the other point that the specific specificity of the CT scan is higher than the PCR. So, uh, so, so do we, you clean your CT scanner in between every patient? You know, yeah, we clean it? Yeah, every patient, yes. That's a lot of work. A spray, yes. <laughs> Another question uh, for, for, for the whole panel, Imran Abbas, uh, uh, our friend on Facebook is asking, is it necessary to rule out COVID-19 in all emergency cases without any symptoms before surgery? Or is it even useful? Dr. Toby, you're muted. Gloria, let's yeah. unmute Dr. Toby. All right, we can hear you now. Well, I think it is important uh, uh, to uh, know where the COVID status of the patient, uh, uh, unless there is uh, uh, some hemorrhagic condition where it is important and that in that case, we consider that patient as a COVID positive patients and take 100% uh, uh, precautions uh, as you take for positive, uh, COVID positive patients. And uh, also we are taking uh, a different uh, uh, consent, very uh, uh, elaborate, informed and under camera, uh, these consents are taken uh, for uh, telling them all the pros and cons. And whenever we are doing any surgery, I think uh, as uh, has been mentioned that we have to use our brain because uh, nobody knows how the things are. Nobody knows the legal requirement of the consent uh, in uh, the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. So I think, you know, a lot of things are unknown, but we should try on principle to make sure that we and our team is most protected, whatever it may cost to protect the medical and paramedical staff and the team, they're uh, sort of, uh, uh, they are very important because if they develop um, uh, positive COVID status, then they are at least 15, 20 staff is out of uh, your operation theater and all the corridors and their families quarantine. Maybe we might uh, lose some of them which have got uh, comorbidities. So on principle, I think all of the medical biomedical staff, I very strongly feel that we should really look after the whole team, minimum possible exposure, and as far as possible, if it is possible to defer or postpone uh, the operation till we get the uh, COVID status. And I'd like to answer kind of a related question that was approached in our paper from the DSS group. Um, should all when elective surgeries are resumed again and people begin to do bariatric metabolic surgery, should all such patients be COVID tested? And the answer from the group was, yes, we think that's appropriate because the kind of people who are seeking bariatric metabolic surgery, they're by definition gonna have obesity and or diabetes. Both of those conditions place them at high risk of infection from SARS-CoV-2 virus and bad outcomes from COVID disease. And as Dr. Pryor showed, the results of, un of undergoing a major operation when you don't realize you have COVID can be disastrous. Those numbers were very high in terms of mortality. So since the population is a higher risk for getting the disease and having it, we think, uh, and that we wouldn't wanna undergo elective surgery while they were COVID positive, we think they should be routinely screened during the startup period again. And by that time, hopefully our testing, you know, access to testing kits will be more uh, widely available than it is now. Okay, another, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Another question comes uh, from uh, Dr. Abdullah Mawas. Uh, he's watching us on our uh, Facebook IBC group. Uh, can we apply the same principles for endoscopy taking history, checking uh, FBC and CPR symptoms, then decide patients into cohort A, B, and C and perform uh, endoscopy in C, but postpone in A and B? So I think the question is regarding um, grouping patients based on symptoms, if I understand well. 
uh, the question. So I would be cautious grouping by symptoms. I, I think if you have a low prevalence of infection, it may be okay. Um, but the high number of people who are asymptomatic and still infected is real. And if you're doing endoscopy, that is an aerosolizing procedure. And there's not a lot of great ways to mitigate that risk. So you're going to be exposing your team and your you know environment and your endo suite to the potential infection. So I personally, unless it's an emergent procedure, would test those patients. Do we have any other comments on that, that particular? Well, just just reflecting the cruise ship experience that uh, Professor Pry has say on Hong Kong, I think Australia, we let one of the cruise ship. It's not Diamond Princess, Ruby Princess, another princess. So whatever dealing with princess is not good. Um, so we leading towards a lot of asymptomatic. Uh, cases that is spreading around in Australia, resulting in possibly accountable for about 20 deaths and also um, 200 people getting infected. And they are allowed to be bought without waiting for the test to come back. And a lot of patients retrospectively found are asymptomatic and develop symptoms afterwards. So I think if we have enough resources, definitely, man, if possible, to test them beforehand. Okay, very, very good. And the very last question. So we have uh, so many questions and comments, but unfortunately time is short. So uh, another question also comes from Poland uh, and this uh, regards uh, a dedicated COVID hospital. Uh, so they wanna know um, if uh, elective uh, oncological cases uh, should be transferred to non-COVID uh, non-dedicated hospital. Um, uh, yes, that's the question. I Tom, think. Uh, Tom, in India, I think we have got a very clear instructions for COVID hospital and a non-COVID hospital. So if you have a COVID hospital, nothing else in that block is not the floor, but the whole hospital block. It becomes a COVID block. And uh, there are uh, three zones uh, where they are there. And we suspect every patient to be COVID positive. The moment he's positive, he's shifted to the COVID block, the whole hospital. And if he's non-COVID, then he moves on to the rest of the uh, other blocks where he can be operated. So in India, either the hospital is a COVID hospital or it's a non-COVID hospital. This speaks to one of the points that Dr. Loy made about the advantage of working in a network of hospitals if you have Know, a whole consortium uh, like the Apollo system in India or the uh, Kaiser system in the United States, you could say, well, hospital A in our system is going to be COVID positive and hospital B is not going to be. It's tougher if you're on your own in your own individual hospital, then you have to say the sixth floor is going to be COVID positive and the fifth floor is COVID negative or something like that. But if you do that, you have to have isolated pathways to get in and out of that, that they don't cross. So you can do that in a hospital, but it has to be completely divided. Yeah, true. Yes. More like a wing, wing A or wing B rather than floor. Yep. In our setting, since our numbers are very low, um, we are a bit also sensitive. We don't say clean and dirty. We say warm and cool, you know, airy. And we label or bisected the emergency, uh, the ward and the operating theaters into warm and cool theaters so that we can um, potentially treat patient that way. That's in the setting that you don't have much choices for transfer, but there have to be a clear line and pathway. Even the flow are taped to just follow the line. So that's how strict you have to be. Good not to use the words clean and dirty. That was sensitive yeah. of you. Yeah, that's awesome. Tom? Okay. Yes, uh, so that was that was a very you know, vibrant discussion. Um, I think this field is evolving uh, every week or every day. We learn more, uh, and thanks to, to this uh, fantastic collaborations uh, from all over the world, uh, we can get information right away from every corner of the of the of the world. Uh, and I have to say that the IBC mission, which was started almost eleven years ago to share experience and knowledge through uh, modern technology like video conferencing right now works perfectly well. So I'm really well, uh, glad we were so ahead of time. I'm really 
grateful for all the members to support us but strongly. Again, thank, thank you so you much. much. For tonight. Thank, thank you so much. We're out of time for this uh, live cast, but I want to thank the panel of experts. Our founder, of course, uh, Professor Tomas Rogula and our IBC Oxford Congress Director, Mr. Harris Kwaja. Remember, you can always watch uh, the previous live cast on IBC Oxford social media platforms and directly at ibcclub.org. I am Dr. Ariel Ortiz, uh, and uh, I want you to remind you that next May 5th, 2020, we have the Mathematical Modeling, Medical Treatment, and Vaccine Development live cast. And uh, please join us for Spotlight on Industry right now, Smoke Evacuation and Insulation Filtration Devices, directly interview done uh, yesterday with ConMed. Hello, my name is Gary Teagan. I'm the Senior Director for Clinical Affairs at ConMed's Advanced Surgical Division. So ConMed Corporation has been dedicated to smoke evacuation for some time. First, with uh, its own line of smoke evacuation products for open surgery and laparoscopic surgery. Uh, second, with the acquisition of SurgiQuest, which brought to a market uh, really best-in-class laparoscopic options for insufflation and smoke evacuation with the air seal system. ConMed purchased a company called Buffalo Filter, which was regarded as the leader in uh, smoke management. The Air Seal IFS, or Intelligent Flow System, works with three different modes of operation. The first mode is Air Seal mode, and that basically provides a constant pneumoperitoneum and continuous smoke evacuation. Uh, it also incorporates the use of the Air Seal access port, which is a valveless trocar. Uh, there's a group of super users, which we've given instructions to, uh, that enables them to use it in such a way that it minimizes the potential for gas venting out the top of the port. Uh, any gas that does go back to the IFS is filtered down to 0 0.01 microns using our proprietary filter, and that was validated independently by an outside organization. Um, the IFS also has a second mode called smoke evacuation mode, and this is our closed loop solution. By closed loop, I mean it. Uh, there's an insufflation line and a smoke evacuation line. It can be used with two conventional trocars, standard trocars, as long as they have uh, lure lock connectors or stop dots. And this basically provides a continuous loop of insufflation and smoke evacuation. When the gas returns to the IFS, it is filtered through the same filter media, which filters down to 0.01 microns. The third mode that the IFS has is something called standard insufflation mode. And this basically functions like any other conventional insufflator. Uh, it provides carbon dioxide and then senses every few seconds to make sure that the pressure is appropriate. But we often recommend the use, uh, certainly in the COVID area, of an ancillary smoke evacuation system, something like the Plume Port Active, uh, which is made by Buffalo Filter, recently acquired by ConMed Corporation. And this product uh, connects to the canister on the ground and also contains a 0 0.1 micron filter. So Gary, tell us about what the whole system is comprised of. So you basically need the IFS uh, and then your choice of three different tube sets. Again, the ASM EVAC for air seal mode, this SEM EVAC for smoke evacuation mode, and what we call the SIM tub or standard, standard insufflation tubing. People buy the air seal system to use it in air seal mode. Uh, the COVID area has actually opened up another opportunity for us uh, with our second mode, uh, which is smoke evacuation mode. And that incorporates uh, a tube set that has two lines that split. One goes to, um, they both go to the stopcocks of individual uh, trocars, conventional trocars. And one is an insufflation line and the other is a, is a smoke evacuation line. Can I understand then that also the micro droplets produced by the ultrasonic uh, devices, will those also be uh, removed? That's a great question. So in both air seal mode and smoke evacuation mode, uh, the air seal IFS is drawing gas from the cavity back to the box for filtration. And that basically, um, it filters any gas that comes back, whether it be uh, 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 smoke from electrocautery or some type of plume from an ultrasonic device. Uh, can be drawn back to the IFS for filtration uh, and then either um, departure out the back of the box in smoke evacuation mode or recirculation back to the, uh, the air seal access port if you're using it in air seal mode. How does one find the devices or contact the company for more information? 
So uh, ConMed is an international organization. Uh, we have primarily direct representation in most countries. We have distributor representation in some countries. Uh, you can certainly email me at garyteagan at conmed.com, and I will forward uh, the contact information for the person requesting uh, information on our products. So this is Spotlight on Industry, Smoke Evacuation and Insufflation. We want to thank Gary Teagan from ConMed Corporation for joining us today. Thank you for having me.